Okay, the input output um, material is in two sets of slides. We'll do one today and we'll do one on next Tuesday. And that'll leave us a little bit of time at the end to cover multiprocessor, multi core um, uh, architecture. So we've just come out of the re memory area, as you know. We covered cache, main memory, even uh, did um, uh, virtual memory, and now we're looking at secondary memory disk, and then we're going to move over to here. But the interesting thing is disk is treated, because it's so slow, like an input-output device from the operating system point of view. From the hardware point of view, it's seen to be part of the memory hierarchy. So the goal of disk, of course, is to give us long-term storage that doesn't forget when the power goes off. We call that non-volatile storage. Uh, it should be cheap, and there should be a lot of it. So that means it's going to be at the lowest level in our memory hierarchy. Uh, a disk works like this. There's a rotating platter or set of platters, and on both sides of it is a magnetic material that can record in uh, north and south-oriented magnetic fields a one or a zero. We're going to take that magnetic material and, and, and divide it into these rings, which are going to be called tracks. And so when we spin it, a fixed head, if I just leave this head here, it's going to see all these tracks as they come in, all these uh, bits as it comes underneath it. Each track will be divided up into groups called sectors. So now you have many tracks, maybe thousands or tens of thousands, and many sectors per track. Um, and the thing rotates at very high speeds in the thousands of revolutions per minute. Um, as I said, it's coated with a magnetic surface. Typically, the number of platters is one to four. A lot of disks just have one and read on the top and bottom side. Some disks have two. Some disks even have four. Obviously, the more uh, platters you have, the more reading heads you need to have. For every platter, you'll have a reading head on the top and the bottom, which can move in or move out. So as it spins, you'll be able to locate any place on the surfaces of the disk, surfaces, both top and bottom. Typically, these platters are anywhere from an inch to three and a half inches in diameter. Diameter. They're getting smaller with time in order to make the disks fit into smaller and smaller locations. Um, as I said, the rotational speeds are anywhere in this range, you know, thousands of RPM. This is a, considered a high rotation speed disk. This is considered now a low rotation speed disk. But of course, over time, those have been moving up. And I won't be surprised if soon we move up past 15,000. Um, the number of tracks on a surface, as you see, is in the tens of thousands. Um, and if you have um, uh, two reading heads, or four, or six, or eight, then all of the tracks that line up vertically are called a cylinder, okay? Because the reading heads move together. So when we move into the inner track on the top platter, the other pairs of reading heads will also be in. And so they'll be defining a little cylinder with a small diameter. When they move to the outer track, they'll all be at the outer track defining um, a, a large diameter cylinder. So we call that a cylinder, okay? And it's all the tracks under the heads, let's say, at a given point on all the surfaces. And there's anywhere from 100 to 500 sectors per track. And a sector is the smallest amount on a disk that can be read or be written. Typically, it's about 500 bytes these days, although there's some effort among the disk manufacturers and computer system designers to move it up to four kilobytes. Right now, it's half a kilobyte. So when you read or write, you move the head, the disk spins underneath it, and you get access to all those 512 bytes of information magnetically. OK, so here's a, a picture of a cylinder. You can see it in red here. Uh, Multi-platter, here's four platters. Outside the mechanical part, because this is literally mechanical with linear motion and, and rotary motion, outside the mechanical part, there's some electronics, which will be um, a cache, which will be just what you expect, some uh, static RAM that's fast, that stores the stuff from the cache. And in case we have uh, a hit, we'll get it much faster than spinning and turning. Um, and we'll have a controller, which is, of course, a sequential circuit. It's a state machine that'll do what's necessary to uh, move the mechanics, give the commands to the uh, low-level electromechanics. OK, now, there's four parts of the time composed to read or write a disk. The four parts are seek time, rotational latency, transfer time, and controller time. You'll see on the next slide that we add them all four up together. Let's see what these are. The seek time is the time for the heads to move to the uh, track that you want, or the cylinder that we want, from where you are to where you want to go. Now, obviously, if it's just next door, it's a very short time. If it's a long way away, it's a long time. It's proportional to the distance, but not linearly proportional. Turns out this is a 
a mechanical problem related to forces, accelerations, and mass. So your physics would help with this, okay? But it's also called a servo control loop problem because the goal mechanically is to position it right to the spot and not have it be vibrating as it gets closer and closer to it. To get stable over the final destination as quickly as possible. So there's a lot of design involved in fast motion. But it's not that fast. The typical time is milliseconds for this, okay? milliseconds for this. So uh, that's not very fast in computer time, as you know. We're looking for gigaset picoseconds and gigahertz, and this is, you know, kilohertz and, mega and milliseconds, so we're a factor of a million slower than the typical processor time. But that's how long it takes to mechanically turn on the power, move the arm, get to the right spot, and say, I'm there, Abby. Okay? Anyway, now, it depends upon the locality of your disk references. If you're here and you go local, it'll be small, but if you're non-local, so it just depends on that. The average seek time may be much less than this. If we can put them all together and we don't have to go zipping all over the disk. You ever seen or maybe even heard your hard disk going tick, 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 You ever heard that noise? You know what it's doing? It's moving, moving, moving. The heads are mechanically having them go back and forth. That's what you're hearing. And so the acceleration and deceleration are making a little bit of noise. Okay, obviously, it'd be much better if they just held in place and the whole platter spun around and then it was time it moved in one and then the whole, you know, that would be lovely. But instead, it's going far enough that you're getting an acceleration and deceleration. Not very good locality. Okay, so what we want to do with the operating system and the disk controller is try to put things on the disk where we won't have to spend this time. Anyway, you can see there's quite a range. Depends upon the disk size, disk manufacturer, how clever these mechanics are done, how smart the mechanical engineers are, et cetera, how light they are, blah, 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 blah. But it also depends upon the locality. You can reduce this by quite a bit if you're clever in your placement of your disk blocks into the sectors. In other words, sectors that are far apart cause long distance and, and therefore long time. Sectors that are close together will be short. That's the first thing here. So, Manufacturers advertise a number, but your operating system and your controller may be able to greatly improve upon that performance number. Okay, second thing is rotational latency. Okay, great. You're at the right track, and now it's time for the sector you want to spin around and come to you. What's the best case? When you get there, it's there. There's no wait time. What's the worst case? When you get there, you just missed it, and it has to spin all the way around. What's the average case? For all possible positions for that sector, what's the average case? half of a rotation. Right? So rotational latency on average, since you can't know the placement, when you go there and ask for it, you're going to have to wait half a turn. Okay? So it's one half of one rotation divided by the number of rotations per minute. We'll give you the answer in minutes and then you convert it to milliseconds. So it turns out if your disk is at 5400 RPM like most of our low-end laptops are, you're going to wait 5.6 milliseconds middle number here, or maybe if you divide this by a fourth kind of on the high side. But if you get one of these really fast 15,000 RPM expensive disks, you'll only have to wait two milliseconds. So your rotational latency time is dependent totally upon the motor speed, the spinning speed of the disk. If you've got more money, you can drop this right down to this. Now don't forget that's one factor in the whole, but it might be the dominant factor. We'll see. All right, transfer time. Once the head is over the beginning of the sector, now it's time to do what? Let the disk spin, read those bits, and spit them out. Well, it turns out the electronics is at least as fast as the um, uh, magnetics and the mechanics. So once you're there, when it spins, that's your transfer speed. So how long does it take then to look at the bits you want to watch? It's related to how many do you want to look at and the rotation speed once again. So, um, typically, uh, you're looking at one or more sectors uh, un under the head. Uh, the typical speed would be something like 70 to 125 megabits per second uh, for transfer rates in 2008. That's not extremely high, but it's not extremely low. Once we get there, we can spit it out pretty good. Already, the first three things tell us what? Disks have rotten latency. They're just terrible getting things started, but once they're started, they're not too bad. Their transfer rate is, yeah, it's not gigabytes per second or gigabits per second, but it's megabits per second, so we're pretty good. Megabytes per second. All right, that's not too bad. So once we get there, we've got decent bandwidth, but man, is the latency awful. It's just pathetic. Okay? It's one of the reasons that we're 
looking to explore alternatives to these mechanical, you know, monsters called this. And if Flash could just get there, we everybody would be so happy to speed up access a lot. Anyway, now notice though that you might have a hit in cache. And so if your disk controller's got a cache on it and you have a hit, then spatial locality in the disk, which means what? What's spatial locality? My left and right neighbor. Got it? When you were reading me, the head probably went by my neighbors too. So what are we going to do with the neighbors? Put them in the cache also. Right? So if you asked for me, because you had to spin under the head anyway, left and right neighbor went under the head, why not read them and put them in the cache along with me? Ah, so we've got both temporal locality going and spatial locality going. It's very likely that after you read me, if you have any kind of locality at all in the file, you're going to want the next sector and then the next sector. Isn't that how files are? Yeah. So the cache makes it possible to get um, high hit rates based upon locality. In, in disk locality can be good and cache transfer rates are much faster. If you're transferring from the disk itself, you have to wait for the rotation of the platter under the head and you can get these speeds. But if it's already in the cache, you can transfer it at electronic speeds with no limit about mechanics. You can get much higher transfer rates. Could you see that distance here? If it's in the cache, we spit it out electronically. If it's not, we're literally reading it off the surface of the disk mechanically. We're turning a motor, and that's how fast I can shuffle the bits out. I can't give bits I haven't seen yet, and I have to wait till the platter gets under my reading head. OK? Any questions so far about this? This is the mechanics, the <laughs> electronics, the magnetics, uh, and all three put together of a disk. All right, I'm sure you had some idea about these things because all of us have computers and all of us have disks and we all know that hard drives fail and maybe we've even seen them taken apart and we've heard about head crashes and we've heard about platters. We might have heard about sectors or tracks or cylinders. I'm sure we've heard of some of this stuff, but I'd like to know if there's any questions you have at this point about these details. Or John, do you have any questions about this slide? No? Okay. Yeah, you do. Okay. Um, obviously, they're stored magnetically on a thin material. You ever seen magnetic tape at all? The kind of audio or video tape? Yeah, you know, it's black and it, and it has some material on the plastic. Imagine that in the same way we've got some magnetic material. Now, there's a head which comes near to it and doesn't touch it. And the head has the ability to take an electromag electronic signal and turn it into a magnetic field. Okay, in your physics, maybe you've learned that electric signals can be made into magnetic and magnetic can be converted into electric. Changing electric fields cause magnetic fields. Changing magnetic fields cause electric fields. Did you learn that? Something like that in physics. Okay, so if I therefore run my electrical signal through some kind of a little loop and run it back, it's like a coil, it's going to make a magnetic signal. If I make the magnetic signal very, very small and, and just localized to some little small area, then when that little small area comes under me and I say polarize it, I give it a pulse, I'm going to make a north-oriented magnetic region right in that little spot. And now when it mo the head moves to the next place or the platter moves, if I say do it again, it makes another one. If I say don't do it again, it, or I say reverse it the other way, it makes a south oriented. So as you know, magnetics, you ever played with magnets, they only go two ways. Magnetic stored energy or stored fields are either north oriented or south oriented. If we want to say positive or negative, if you want to say one or zero. That's the lovely thing about magnetics. It likes to store in a nice bipolar kind of a way. So you simply go around making spots of ones and zeros as the platter spins by this electrical energy converted into a magnetic energy. The magnetic energy that you're exerting hits the magnetic material and it lines it all up. I don't know if you ever played with magnets, but if you put some iron on the, on the table, you bring a magnet near it, they all go, hi, hi, Abby. You know, they all line up according to the field of the magnet. Have you ever played with magnets? You ever done any kind of little simple science at home? Okay, so this material that's on the surface of the disk can't move exactly, but its magnetic field can reorient, okay? So that's what's going on basically, but it's very, very tiny areas that are focused in a track, literally one bit, one bit, one bit, one bit, one bit, you know, in a row in a very dense location. Therefore, the head has to come very close in order to make a tiny area. The further away the head is, the bigger the power you need and then the larger the area. You want really small area and high density, the head has to come very close to the surface of the disk. Yes, more questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, so why don't we use uh, wires of the whole uh, 
stable heads instead of moving, moving heads. heads. Well, if the head was stable, that'd be great, but how could I write anything over here? If the head is fixed here and I can't move it. If you use many heads. Huh, many heads, okay. Let's go back. How many heads would I need to use? Okay, it turns out that's not easily possible. I guess that's a great idea. Then the head wouldn't have to move, it would just stay stable, but 50,000 individual writing heads all lined up with, you know, apparently not possible. I guess maybe the coils or the area gets too big, and so it needs to be able to move over the spot at once, but it can't stay there and have a neighbor right next door doing the tracks nearby. I'm sure they've thought of that at the disc manufacturers. It's <laughs> a great idea. Okay, the last one is the controller time. Oh, come back here. The last one is the controller time. So we've got seeking time to move the head, rotational time to spin the platter, transfer time to spin the platter a little more and get the bites out, and then the last one is the controller time. There is a state machine controller called a disk controller. It's going to have some kind of algorithm that it runs, and there may be a bit of delay there, an overhead maybe 0.2 milliseconds. Okay? So now we've got four factors. So the average time to read or write a 500 12 byte single sector for a disk rotating at 15,000 RPM. Keshke, I had one that went that fast. I'm still at 5,400. Anybody here got a 7,200? Probably on your desktop. Maybe in your laptop. Anybody here got a 10,000? No. Anybody here got a 15,000? Anybody here know anybody that has one? If you do, you know a very happy person because their operating system boots quickly. Whenever they click an icon, the file opens quickly because it comes in fast. You know? Anyways, um, you can see that uh, the average seek time of 4 milliseconds is given, the transfer rate is given, and um, the um, uh, controller overhead is given. Well, therefore, if you've given those factors, the average time to read or write this particular disk is what? Well, average seek time, 4 milliseconds. Next factor is rotational latency. So what? 0 0.5 divided by the RPM, changing it into how many seconds per minute, so we end up with, uh, well, actually it should change into milliseconds, so it needs to be, you know, 60,000 milliseconds per minute. Anyway, um, plus then this is the transfer time because we're transferring 512 bytes and our transfer rate is 100 megabytes per second. So half of a kilo divided by 100 mega, that's going to be some number and you convert that to milliseconds plus the controller time. And the answer is 4 plus 2 plus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.2 grand total 6.2. Of 6.2 milliseconds, that tells me how many individual disks reads I could do in a minute, could, doesn't it? Or in a second, because each one takes 6.2. So therefore, I could only do what about 100 and you know 50 or so, 160 in a whole in a second. Different disk reads. They're slow. They're really slow. 150 disk reads per second. How many instructions can you execute in a second? Oh, a few billion, you know. So this is really slow by comparison. Now. Another factor to thing, look, thing to look at is look at this, 6.2 milliseconds for the whole thing. What's the reason it's that slow? You'd have to say the head getting to the right track. That's the dominant factor. Four out of my 6.2 is that, isn't it? Well, what if we were to say to the uh, manufacturer, you know, you quoted four milliseconds, but I know that my operating system is going to have very good placement on the disk and I'm not going to have that kind of, you know, average seek time. Mine's going to be one-fourth of that. So if the measured average seek time is just one-fourth of what the manufacturer advertises in their specifications because you have good locality, then the equation runs again. Instead of 4.0, it's going to be 1.0. And so now we get 3.2. And I want to ask you, if you want to speed this up, Where's the candidate? Make the common case fast. What should we do? You want to make that faster. You're not happy with 300 disk accesses per second. This, don't forget, it was 160. Now we're up to 300 disk accesses per second, but it's still not, or 310 or 320. To make it go faster, what do you suggest we do? I think that's the one, isn't it? Make the slow case fast. That's the common one. That's where I'm spending most of my time, out of my 3.2. So how do I speed that up? make the motor go faster. Yeah, exactly. The only trouble is we're already going 15,000 
RPM, and that's the high end, and you're paying a lot of money for that, so not easy to say to the disc manufacturers, when are you coming out with a 30,000 RPM disc? I'm ready to spend my $8,000 for it. <laughs> They're not ready to sell it to you yet. All right, we'll look at some performance manufacturing specifications from discs in just a minute. All right, so do you see how the analysis is done? So from this, the question could be answered, how many disc accesses to read a sector can we do per second? Just the inverse of this, right? 1,000 milliseconds divided by 6.2 or divided by 3.2 will tell me how many individual disk sectors I can read in a second if they're all independent from each other. That's different from saying they're all lined up after each other. That's something else. If they're all, but if they're randomly placed, then this is the time for one random uh, disk access. So the rotational latency these days is usually the largest component of access time. So if you are not happy with your disk performance and you think that your computer is running slow because your disk is slow, you could help yourself a lot by, first off, doing what? What's the first thing you could do? Disk defragmenting. What will disk defragmenting do? It'll put sectors that are related in a file back together. You'll get better locality, so you'll start moving from this to this. What's the next thing you could do? After your disk is defragmented, what else could you do to make your disk performance faster? Increase yeah, increase the rotation speed. Take out that old 5400 disk, go down to the computer store, say, I want a fast new one. How much does it cost? And talk price performance and figure out what you can afford and say, I'm going to double my speed from 5400, I'm going up to 10,000. You'll be amazed at what that'll do. Because these are trivial. See, those aren't really the big number here. The big two numbers are this and this. All right, so you will gain if you work on this or work on that. You will gain. Also, modern fast rotation disks also tend to have the high-tech, high-end mechanical engineering to make the head move faster as well. So you get good seek times and good rotational latencies because you paid for it. I mean, if you buy some little cheap low-end thing in the, you know, 600 lira laptops, of course, don't expect performance. But if you're willing to spend some money for disk, you can get much better performance from your... Every file you load, including your operating system at the beginning, your shutdown at the end, and every time you click an icon, when that dude comes off of disk, you'll see much faster performance if you want. I mean, it's up to you. Okay, let's go on. Now, interface standards. Disks, of course, are interfaced by disk controllers to buses in order to get their data to the memory and the processor or from. And um, we have these high-level interfaces. Oftentimes, they now have a microprocessor in them. The disk controller is not just a state machine with fixed hardware and a few registers to write to it. It's actually a microprocessor disk controller that can do performance optimizations and be coded. You don't write the code for it. It's done by the disk manufacturer, but it's running algorithms. Okay? Two that you should know about are ATA and SCSI, referred to as SCSI. You know? ATA is Advanced Technology Attachment. And it's an interface standard for things particularly that go into personal computers, okay? So storage devices like hard drives, solid state drives, CD-ROMs. There used to be a parallel ATA with many lines uh, at lower bus speeds. Now there's a serial ATA, much higher speeds, okay? So instead of mega cycles per second now, we're in the high hundreds of megas or even gigas at serial. And so the number of lines is much, much smaller. And it's widely used, as I said, in personal computers. Now, SCSI... SCSI stands for something that nobody ever remembers, computer systems, small computer systems interface. Everybody just calls this SCSI. And um, it's a set of standards, including protocols on you know, handshaking and everything, electrical and optical interfaces. Notice two different kinds. You can do it over wire. You can do it over optical. For physically connecting and transferring data between computers and peripheral devices. Notice this is primarily storage devices. This is any kind of peripheral device that wants to have a SCSI interface. And it's most commonly used for hard disks and for tape drives in more expensive systems. The last two times I went and bought a computer, one of these Yap Majulik computers, when they make it for you, they said, do you want your uh, disk interface to be SCSI? I said, maybe, tell me about it. And they said, well, it costs this. I said, what is the alternative cost? It costs this. I'm cheap, so I bought this. I didn't get a SCSI. SCSI costs more, okay? It's an industry standard interface, but it, more expensive. But you get pluggability with other systems, but anything that fits standard SCSI can be taken off and put on somewhere else. You get performance, you get a lot of reliability. Anyway, um, the disk controllers these days, whether they're ATA, serial ATA, or, or SCSI, have 
SRAM, not DRAM, static RAM, the fast, good stuff, the pricey stuff, caches, which support very fast access to anything that's already been put in cache. So you will have both recently read data and even, as it says there, prefetched data. Algorithms in the microprocessor which control it are guessing what we should fetch before you even ask. Hey, you know what? I think he's going to ask for next. Let's go get it now. The disk is always spinning. It's no big deal for the head to read something and put it in the cache if you have room. If you think you're going to need it later, it's kind of like predicting the future. But these are amazing. The processors can be built with algorithms that have memory that watch what you did last time when you opened that file and blah, blah, blah. And they can know what your access patterns are. It anticipates your demand, OK? Always correctly, no, but apparently effectively enough to be worth doing. All right, here's some disks. There's a, a table in the book that actually is a little bit bigger than this. The book table has four. They're from Seagate. Raise your hand if you've heard of Seagate. Yeah, pretty famous disk manufacturer. Okay. All right, these, there's the fourth one in the book's table. This didn't fit, so here's just three. What I'd like to do is just quickly look at a couple of the key parameters. How big is the disk? These days people want little, they want smaller and smaller. So therefore, you come down here to how many gigabytes per cubic inch and how many gigabytes per watt. It turns out, you know, small but a lot of storage, small but not much power is important. Gigabytes that it stores, and we've got quite a range here from 1,000 gigabytes, that's a big disk, to 73, that's really tiny. Okay, now why would anybody want a 73 gigabyte disk? The answer is because it's high performance. It spins at 15,000 RPM. It has a very high transfer rate, has a very low minimum seek time. This is a performance disk. It also tends to have uh, a higher mean time till failure. This is when it's going to fail. Million two hundred thousand hours, million nobody knows, and million six hundred thousand. This is a re high reliability, high performance disk, but of course you're going to pay for it. Does it have cost on here anywhere? It didn't have it, on, maybe it's in the book, but anyway, the cost per yeah, gigabyte, the cost per gigabyte, as you can see here, is 30 cents, 60 cents, $5. Yeah, it's about five times as much or even, you know, 15 times as much as this per gigabyte. So you better be getting something, and the answer is you are. You're getting a very high performance disk. Um, here's another one, 160 gigabyte, kind of in the middle. Um, notice this is the slowest. Okay, so we've got three different speeds, 5,400, 72, and 15,000 represented here. The seek times are quite different. Can you see this? Very low for read and write. Medium for read and write. Very slow for read and write. Okay. Um, dimensions, weight, you know, power. All these are things people care about. Not just how big is it, how fast it is, but how small is it, how much power does it burn, you know, uh, how dense is it, uh, how reliable is it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, per gigabyte it is, per gigabyte. Uh, the answer is because this one's got so many gigabytes. Don't forget, a motor is a motor, whether you're spinning four platters or two platters. Notice this one went with four platters in order to get a lot greater um, uh, uh, capacity. You still have to have a motor, still have to have a case, still have to have a, a cache and an interface. So all those are fixed costs. And so if you divide by 160 gigabytes, it's going to be much higher per gigabyte than if you divide by 1,000 gigabytes. That, I would say that's the answer. Capacity means per gigabyte gets cheaper. Big disks make it cheaper. We all know that, don't we? You know, you go buy a disk and it's 320. The guy says, hey, I can sell you 500 and it's only a little more. And you think, yeah, he's right, just a little more money and a much bigger capacity. Why? Because once you have the case, the motor, the drivers, the cache, it's not much more money just to make the platter, extra platters or a little bit bigger, a little bit denser platters. That's not, that's not where the money is. OK, um, I recommend to you the table in the book. It has good commentary. It has a fourth disk. It has more lines of data. You should not be ignorant of disks. You're a computer engineer. This is a crucial resource in computer systems. This is a hardware course, so what can I do? You know, emphasize, don't be ignorant. Right? What do they say? Bilma mek aip deil sorma mek aip ter. So, you know, if there's something you don't know, that's okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. It, then you need to fix it. You need to you get curious and learn about it. Okay, um, now, this is a little history chart that shows where have disks come from. And so if you look at the dates, 83, 90, 94, 98, 2003, you expect that we're going to see progress when we go this way. Let's see what kind of progress we've got in gigabytes. 
Yep, coming up pretty fast, especially at the end here. How about size? Yeah, they're getting smaller. What about bandwidth? Yep, they're pushing out the data faster. What about latency to get the first bit? Yep, that's coming down too. Just what you expect. You know, nice development. So when we put 2010 here, we put 2015 here, so on. We expect the curves to keep going that way. Latency is the average seek time plus the rotational latency, so speed and mechanics of motion. Bandwidth is the peak transfer rate uh, that you can get it out from the media, not from the cache. But the problem is this. Look at this. This one, the red one, is bandwidth. That's your transfer rate out. That's going up exponentially. This one is your latency. That's dropping exponentially, but they're not changing at equal rate. You can see that the latency is slowed down. It's really just not getting fast, very fast, getting small, much fa very fast. But the bandwidth is getting fast or larger, much faster. So what you have is unequal change. The, in the time the bandwidth doubles, the latency only improves by a factor of 1.2 or even 1.4. So it's not keep, they're not equal uh, pace. So what do you expect, therefore, in 15 more years? What do you expect in 15 more years? Same Some improvement in latency. It'll be a little bit faster to get there and a whole lot of bandwidth improvement. Man, when you get there, you can really blast it out. Okay, so what does that say? Slow to get there. Once you get there, you can get a lot. What does that sound like anything we've seen before? Yeah, main memory. Slow to get the first thing out of the DRAM. Once you've got a whole row, might as well just take them all because once you're there, push them out. All right, so we get the same performance here, same issue. Slow to get the first one. After that, you can get a lot pretty quick. Latency is high. <coughs> bandwidth is, is high, getting high even faster. Well, now, let's talk about an alternative to disk. This is one I'm very personally very excited about, and this is Flash. All of us have probably right now in our pocket got at least one, maybe two, maybe three different things with flash memory. Have you got a personal digital assistant? Have you got a camera with you? Have you got a cell phone with additional memory? Have you got any kind of a little digital device? It's probably got flash memory. At least you have probably one of these little USB jump drives. So this has become a huge thing, okay? No disk needed because we can store gigabytes on those. Not thousands, not hundreds yet, but tens of gigabytes are now storable at very affordable rates and much faster. How, how long does it take to get the first byte off of a flash? The answer is not milliseconds, not even microseconds, okay? Much, much faster access. Um, let's talk about that. Um, flash memory is the first credible, that means believable, serious uh, challenger to uh, disk in a very, very long time. It's non-volatile, so it doesn't forget when the power goes off. It has latency. 100 to 1,000 times faster on you know, a lower latency. Then remember the problem with latency on this is it's not really dropping very fast. It's kind of flattening out. Oh no, you know, we need it to keep going down fast and it's not. Here's some hope to get it a lot faster. And is smaller, absolutely. More power efficient, that's real important. All kind of portable things don't want to have to run the motor of a hard drive. And it's more shock resistant. If you drop your hard drive on the floor and you drop your memory stick on the floor, which one's more likely to survive? Those delicate heads, bang, that's it. Head crash, you're done. Your, your data's destroyed. If the head touches the platter, you're out of business. Okay, it's mechanical. There's, there's things to, inside it that are, you know, have weight and mass. On the other hand, drop a piece of solid state semiconductor, not much is likely to happen unless you smash it. In 2008, the price of flash is $4 to $10 per gigabyte. $4 to $10 per gigabyte. Let's go back and ask what's the price of hard drive? 30 cents to $5 per gigabyte. Okay, now this says flash is competitive and faster too and lighter too. But this says no, flash is still not competitive. $4 to $10 per gigabyte. Here we're talking 30 cents to 60 cents. So what does that say to you? Maybe Flash can be an Arakatman, or maybe if it keeps improving, it'll just take away this. Right now, this still has a place because of its price, okay, and its huge capacity. Well, you're not going to get a flash drive that big. You'd spend a lot of money to get a flash drive that big. That's probably still off the map, okay? I mean, you could afford it, but just barely, a lot of money. 
All right, so those are some things to think about. Look at the capacities of these flash drives that were done, I think this is 2006 or 2008. 8 gigabyte, 16 gigabyte, 32 gigabyte, pretty big, getting a large size there. Uh, bytes per sector, everybody's trying to do what? Copy disk, 512 bytes per sector, exactly like disks are. They even call it a sector on a, on a flash drive. Transfer rates in megabytes per second, uh-oh, not really very good, four. 20 or 18, 68, 50. What kind of numbers did we have for the, for the disk drives? Yeah, 100, but from cache, 320. Yeah, so, three, you know, 100, 100, and this is nothing here is close to 100. So we, we got much better um, latency, but not as good bandwidth. Okay, now moving on. Mean time till failure, how long do these last? A million hours, million hours, 4 million hours, better, okay. And then price, 30 bucks for, Eight is about four dollars per gigabyte. Seventy dollars for sixteen is about five dollars per gigabyte. Three hundred dollars for thirty-two is about ten dollars per gigabyte. Okay, so you can see that yeah, that's about right. You know what did it say here? Four to ten dollars per gigabyte, or a factor of two to ten higher than our current disk. So the question is, they're not the same. Do you think Flash is going to be able to just take over and wipe out the disk market, or will it find a separate place and we'll still always have disks? or maybe just in some applications that need a huge amount of storage, but modest and small amounts of storage can be done in semiconductor solid state. If you think about that, but I think in your career, you're going to see a revolution come, and this is not going to go away. This is going to keep coming, and disks are going to have to retreat a bit in, in their area. Right now, it's hard to find a computer without a disk, but I did see a few for sale. I said, how does it work, diskless? They said, oh, we've got a lot of flesh instead. Hmm. How much does it cost? <laughs> or how much flash has it got? Not very much. Uh, you know, right now there's a trade-off between price and quantity of, of backup storage. Any questions about, about flash and disk? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking is, is putting in uh, flash as an intermediate level between main memory and, and hard drive as a non-volatile. The only problem is, um, do you need two levels of non-volatile storage? You think about it. When the power goes off, you're going to be storing copies on both, or writing everything back to the big one, or what are we going to do? Yeah, it, it, the place of how you would use it is still up in the air. If you displace disk completely, you'd use it like disk. But if you added it in as a middle level, then what would it be its relationship to, to disk? You can create a clever algorithm that uh, puts the programs that requires less amount of disk space mm -hmm. to work on flash, mm -hmm. and the programs which requires yeah. more amount of disk space. Okay. In now, I would rather have a different algorithm that put the programs I use frequently on uh, Flash and the programs I use infrequently in disk. Why would I want to do that? But what if Flash is unsufficient? Well, I mean, the, the most frequently used program that I use is my operating system. I would love for that to come in quick and get out quick. It's, right now, it's very slow. So if I could get my operating system off disk and onto Flash, I'd be a very happy boy, very happy boy because then it would, I'd get huge speed ups all the time. Every time I request anything from Windows, it goes bzz, 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 and it comes in. It doesn't matter if I want to defrag my disk, doesn't matter if I want to do Windows Explorer, doesn't matter if I want to do you know, Internet Explorer, bzz, bzz, bzz. You know, it's always bringing it in from the disk. And I would just love for that operating system with all its many features to be stored in flesh. But like you said, it's big, unfortunately. It, usually the operating system is the biggest program you have. So that's a challenge right there, is to find frequently used but as Ur says, small enough programs that you would store in your flash memory. Okay, let's take a break. That's a good place to come to. We'll continue after the 10-minute break and more with disks.